Hi everybody, I hope you're doing well. Um, this is our Foundations of Teaching English Language Learners course and today we're going to be looking at the stages of language acquisition, Bix and Kelp, the contextual quadrant, and the costs of ESL bilingual education. So this aligns with chapters 3 and 4 in the Samway and McCune book and then chapter 1 in the um, Zuniga Dunlap book. If you have done that reading, you can do it either before or after this lecture, but you should see the similar concepts and I want to explain some of these concepts. All right. When we talk about language development for multilingual learners, if you are a simultaneous, you can either acquire two languages simultaneously and sequ or sequentially, right? Remember what simultaneous or sequential mean, right? Simultaneous means at the same time. So if you're going to learn the language at the same time, first, and you're a child, you're going to use single words from multiple languages. And then you'll start to separate the words from each language and use words with grammar structures and recognize to which person the language is typically spoken. Um, typically happens around, right, three, four, five. Um, and then one language is used more than the other, and that language often becomes dominant in particular situations. So often for students living in the United States, um, this becomes um, English. If you are learning something sequentially, i.e. you speak one language and you're, you're all, we're all going to go to, you know, uh, Finland and we're learning Finnish, um, what's going to happen, right? So the first stage is that uh, the child observes speakers of the second language and may be silent. This is often called the silent period, can last for six months to a year because they're, they are taking everything in. The child may communicate non-verbally or use short phrases at this point. Um, in the next couple stages, you'll see the child communicating with others in the second language and starting to create their own sentences. And then um, as you continue learning a language, you'll build greater consciousness of rules for vocabulary, grammar, and pronunciation, kind of more details in communication. And then finally, you'll be able to use that specialized language skills aligned with academic settings similar to your monolingual peers. Think of us, if we all went to Finland, we would be learning communication first, right, before we would be ready to be in a university class and finish, right, because there would be a lot more specialized language. Um, so this chart is large. I'm going to talk through it a little bit and we'll revisit it on Tuesday um, with some activities. So these are some sample things that the teacher might ask a student to do at each stage of this second language acquisition. So in that pre-production or silent phase, um, the teacher might prompt a student to show you something or circle something or identify a place, right, or a person. In the early production stage, with one to two responses and ability to use keywords and familiar phrases, the teacher might ask more yes or no questions, either or questions, who, what, and how many questions. The speech emergent stage, um, the student has good comprehension, can produce simple sentences, um, and the teacher is starting to ask why, oops, how, um, and explaining things. And the intermediate fluency stage, um, in which the student has really good comprehension, the teacher can start asking questions like what would happen if, why do you think, or questions you're writing more than a sentence response. Um, unfortunately, my screen is cutting off the bottom, but the next stage is called advanced fluency, and that's where the student has a near native level of speech, um, and that's typically five to seven years. So we'll revisit this on Tuesday, um, and those are more open-ended questions that you're asking the student to produce more language. We're going to talk a little bit about communication versus academic language. And in ESL terms, this is often called BIC versus CALP. Okay, BIC stands for Basic Interpersonal Communication Skills, and CALP stands for Cognitive Academic Language Proficiency. But we can really think of it, I just want you to know what the terms are, so if you see them, you know what they are. We can really think about it as communication versus academic and specialized language. So think about the other, if you know a language other than English, think about the language that you know. Um, other than English, and I, we're going to do some translation. So the first thing I want you to try and translate is this. My name is. I'll do it in French. Je m'appelle. You see if you can do it in the other language or languages you speak. Next, I am thirsty. May I please have a drink of water? In French, would this be? This would be. J'ai soif. J'aimerais boire de l'eau. J'aimerais avoir um, un boire, un boire de l'eau. Try this one. After we finished school in June, my family spent our summer vacation visiting relatives in Eritrea. If I did this in, Eng in French, I would say, Après qu'on a fini l'école en juin, ma famille est 
passer nos vacances en visitant la famille en Eritrée. See if you can do it in the other language you speak. And just pause this if you need more time. And now what about this one? Worms are called decomposers. They have a special job, which is to eat leaves, grass, and other things in nature to help break them down into smaller pieces. We are going to study worms more closely by making a compost bag. Okay, in French, not perfect, but I'll do it, all right? Un les verbes s'appellent les décomposeurs. Ils ont un boulot spécial, c'est-à-dire qu'ils mangent les feuilles, l'herbe et les autres choses de la nature pour les briser dans les pièces plus petites. On va étudier les verbes uh, plus prochement en faisant un sac de compost. Now you try it in your language. Or think about how many words, if you're a novice learner of, of Spanish or German or something, think about how many words you would know. Do you know leaves? Do you know eat? So my question for you is, what's the difference between the language at the beginning? One, two, and even three versus that fourth one. And why do you think sometimes when students can say the first three just fine, um, might teachers assume they could say or read that fourth one? Right? So we see in the first three that we see um, conversational language that has less specific vocabulary, less uh, complex sentence structures. In that fourth one, we see academic vocabulary with specific language, like decomposer, uh, compost bag. We also see sentence structures that are longer, right? They have a special job, which is to eat leaves, grass, and other things. You don't talk like that, right? I don't say, I have a special snack in my car, which is to say, I went to McDonald's today. I don't talk like that, right? It's a special kind of academic language. So these are some questions to consider, right? Um, we saw some representative interpersonal communication, some of academic language. Think about why the academic items are more difficult to translate, even if you have had many years of instruction in a second language. Um, and then this is the question I asked before, right? Teachers often hear students making comments, such as those in A, B, or C, and then um, dismiss language as a potential cause when those same students have difficulties in class. So why, why might teachers think that? Why is it easy to think that? Um, and then imagine you're a student whose teacher has just spoken the word seen in D, but you are not proficient in the English language. Brainstorm a list of things your teacher could do to help you understand what was being said. So do this in your notes, and then you can bring this in on Tuesday, your list. And you can think about how this activity might help you to better understand um, part, some of the needs of an ELL student. We'll talk again more and do an do a in-person activity on Tuesday. So I'm going to have you watch a video, and it's going to be linked below this. Um, so in looking at applying Bix versus Calp, I'm going to post a video of a student talking with a teacher, and I want you to think about which types of communication skills a student has and which is she still developing, you know, Bix versus Calp. Um, take notes on that, and we will we'll discuss. All right, our text talks about some key factors in language learning, so in learning both Bix and Calp. These are having comprehensible content, i.e. you have to understand what is going on or you will not learn anything. You have to understand at least something of what's going on, right? Or you're not going to learn anything. Affective filter, which means the more worried and stressed you are, the less you're going to be able to pay attention to learning language. And I think you probably have experienced this in other classes, right? If you're super stressed about a class, you're not able to kind of concentrate and focus and learn. Um, this principle, the affective filter, is also called every ESL teacher's excuse for having fun in class. Okay. Um, our text talks about positive task orientation, which is the sense that there, there is something and you can do it, right? You have the sense that it's doable, you can do it. Um, and the last is tolerance of ambiguity. I think if you have studied a second language, you know this, but sometimes you don't know everything that's going on, you can't quite figure everything out, and you just have to keep going anyway. And just kind of figure out what you can, and there's a lot of shades of gray. So it helps if you're able to to be okay with that and handle shades of gray. Um, if you have to know if you're right or wrong and you want to be perfect, it can be very hard. Um, and that can just be a hurdle in, in learning a second language or a third. So Commons has some quadrants that help us think about kelp and Bix and whether something's understandable. And these are called kind of um, Cummins quadrants related to context. So at the top, you can see the cognitively undemanding languages, tasks, and activities, i.e. easy things. The bottom are hard things, 
on the left is context embedded, things that have a lot of context clues so you know what's going on, and at the right, context reduced, things that do not have a lot of context so you don't know what's going on. So um, these are some examples of different tasks that happen in a classroom and where they fall. So for example, easy stuff, um, the easiest things are going to be on the left, right, for language learners. Copying from the board, reading a map, face-to-face -face conversation, looking at directions or illustrations, those have a lot of context clues and they're pretty easy. Okay, at the bottom, right, these are the hardest things um, for language learners, right? Standardized tests, math concepts and applications, listening to a lecture, a reading content class, kind of a lot of reading and very little support, um, textual or contextual support. Um, and so the idea behind this is in general, if you're working with an English learner, you want to try and move the things in B and D into A and C. So you want to take the things that don't have a lot of context and give them context so they're more understandable. It doesn't mean you're making them easy, right, because the things in C are still pretty cognitively demanding, right? It's still, you can ask a lot of really good questions, do a lot of good thinking with science experiments and demonstrations and math computations, um, but you want to make, um, scaffold those tasks in B and D to make them more understandable, and then students will be able to do them better. Just some quick notes to kind of conclude this on numbers, and this is mostly from the Sam Wayne McEwen book. Um, so, in general, the number of English learners in Illinois and in most states, United States, has increased in the past 15 years. But it is important to point out that it is not at some kind of all-time high, right? The percentage of English learners in the United States was highest in the 1890s to 1910s, right? That huge European um, immigration wave that was encouraged by the national government. Um, it was lower after World War II, um, and then it's higher again now. So it's not an all-time high or anything, but it is um, at a higher point, right, in the fluctuations of history. Um, 1.5 billion people currently worldwide are learning English as a second language, so it is a worldwide thing, right? English is a global language, um, and so it's not only folks in the U.S., but folks in many, many countries. Um, and there are some maps I have you check out um, to kind of where you can see where those things are. And then, you know, just as an example, there's a percentage increase in the number of English learners in the UK as well, from half a million in, um, you know, the 90s to 1 million closer to today, right, or one in six students, um, multilingual English learners in the UK. So this kind of increase is not um, solely in the US, right? Um, this is just a chart of the number of Yales in Illinois schools. You can see a change from 60,000 in 1990 to 180,000 in 2010. So 20 years, about triple, um, and about 10% of all students in Illinois. So not a majority or anything, but um, English learners could have been born in the U.S. About 70% of English learners are born in the U.S. or in another country. Um, the most commonly spoken language in Illinois is Spanish, I'm at 80%. Um, Polish 3%, Arabic 3%, Urdu 1%, and then a number of other languages, up to 130, and um, with smaller populations. A quick rundown of the cost of bilingual education, right? Our Sam Wayne McEwen book points out um, that bilingual education, dual language, and ESL education, we will talk about those programs in a later in the course, what those are. Cost about 550 to 650 per year per student, kind of adjusted for today's dollars. Depends on the number of students in the model. Um, but appropriate services do lead to fewer school dropouts, right? So a study out of Northeastern U found that high school dropouts in general cost taxpayers 292000 over the course of their lives. So there's a cost of services. There's also a cost to not providing services. So, so a benefit into being bilingual. In the U.S. and Canada, bilingual individuals tend to earn 7 to 8% higher salaries than monolinguals. And whether they're speak English at home or don't speak English at home, right, Whether if they're bilingual or if you are bilingual. Um, and then this is just a note showing the increase in English proficiency um, among Hispanic children in the U.S. These are numbers from the Pew Research Center from 2015, um, so from some of their surveys, and that in general English proficiency has been rising from as there have been more um, immigrants or, you know, more English learners in schools, actually more people are proficient, um, right? So 73% um, of um, Latinos ages five and older speak um, Spanish at home, 68% speak English proficiently. On the left, 70% um, of foreign-born children um, who are Hispanic um, speak English very well.
and that number is lower for adults.